Welcome back everyone. I hope you've had a really good week. Saying affirmations that you know are true really does make a huge difference, doesn't it? The most amazing thing about last week's work is that it feels really good to be truthful with yourself about your affirmations, about the food you're eating, and all the aches and pains in your body. Getting in touch with your solar plexus is a pretty awesome experience too, and I really hope you're able to feel that connection between your body's energy and the universal energy during your meditation, but even if you couldn't feel that connection, just to feel the energy moving in your body is enough. Now remember that that energy is all one and the same, so we're gonna take that idea and run with it today. So this week, I wanna introduce you to your true self. Now the part that controls you is not your body or your conscious mind or your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind gets its information from the solar plexus. That energy that flows through your body is the same energy that flows through the universe, and hopefully you felt that energy in your meditation. In the Master Key System, which is the book that this course was based off of, Charles Haniel calls this energy the I, a capital letter I in quotation marks. The I is the power that tells your mind what to think, and the I is the power that tells your physical body how and where to move. Your eye is bigger than your body, it's your spirit. We're gonna spend this week learning about who you really are, that what you think, do, or feel is an indication of your real self. Remember that thought is energy, and energy is power. Now we've tended to focus on the energy or the effect of this energy instead of the cause, the things with physical form, instead of the thoughts that have created those things. This is how we come up with labels for things like good and bad. Both are just a manifestation of the energy of thought. Good and bad are the effects of the quality of thought. It's time to reverse that process and focus mainly on the cause. When you find the cause, you're able to secure anything that's necessary for your welfare and your happiness. Life is expressive and each and every one of us is responsible to express ourselves in a constructive manner. So we've started the process of eliminating anything that we don't need from our minds, like unhappiness and poverty, disease and misery, all those limitations, the things you wrote down in week one. Now you know now that to overcome those limitations, you have to strengthen the quality of your thoughts. When you have stronger thoughts that are pure in quality, then the way you express yourself in the world will also be of a higher quality. So let's talk about what the I is and what it's not. The eye of you is not your body. Your body is just how you carry things out. It's the hands that the eye uses to write. It's the feet that I use to walk. It's the voice that I use to express my thoughts. It's the muscles that I use to convey emotions when I smile. Now I'm gonna be crystal clear about something. Your body is only a container that holds who you really are. When your spirit leaves your body, what do you have left? It's a shell and it looks like you, but it can't continue to carry on your purpose. The I is not your conscious mind. It's actually directing your thoughts. It's not even your personality. Your personality is a combination of all the habits you've picked up during your life and is the result of your thoughts. Your personality is constantly changing. It's also not the I. Even your subconscious mind is not the I. When you say, I think, it's the I that tells you what to think. When you say, I go, it's the I that tells you where to go. The I is the piece of you that tells you what your big picture options are. It's the starting point of everything in your being. And here's the cool part. This I is collective. It connects you to everyone and everything in the universe. Now, I can't prove this to you in any other way than through your own experiences. So your exercises this week will help you to see this connection. But again, for right now, just stick with me if it seems a little odd. If the I in you is part of the I of everyone and everything in the universe, then to use this power to your advantage, you can't act selfishly. If you've noticed that life doesn't seem to be going in the right direction for you, it could be because you're thinking and acting in a selfish way. Every thought and every plan you set into motion has to benefit everyone who's connected to that plan in any way. Anytime you try to benefit yourself by exploiting the weakness or the ignorance of another person will ultimately lead to discord in your life. Now, some people call this karma, but it's different than the idea that somewhere someone is keeping score of your good and your bad deeds. But what it really comes down to is that if the I is part of the universal mind, then so is your neighbor's I and so is your coworker's I. You're all one in the whole. Trying to benefit from the demise of your neighbor is like strengthening your arms by punching yourself in the legs over and over. Maybe your arms get strong, but if you can't walk, you're not getting anywhere. 
You simply can't antagonize another part of the whole. The health of the whole universal mind depends on the recognition of the interests of everyone you affect. When you realize that when you say I, you mean something bigger than your own mind or your own body, you start to come into this power of the universal energy. You realize that the base of your goals is to make the world a better place for everyone, and that energy is not just yours, but also your neighbors and your coworkers. When you understand the true nature of saying I and your goals are constructive and harmonious, you'll become invincible because you're aligned with the creative and infinite power of the universe. People sometimes mistake the energy for something completely outside of them and entities separate from themselves. No, it is, and it's not. It's part of you, and it's part of the whole. It's just as much a part of you as it is part of every human being and every plant and every animal in the entire universe. Now, if you're the believer in a deity, it means that your eye is also part of your God, and that's a pretty powerful realization. If you're not religious, then you can realize that your eye is part of the scientific power of the universe, and that's also incredibly cool. Either way, realizing that the creative eye in you is one and the same as the creative eye outside of you will completely change your perception of how and what you want to accomplish in your life. Now, knowing this, let's go back to this idea of selfishness. It's not success to deny yourself the things you need and want. You can't give unless you get. You can't help others unless you're healthy, strong, and happy. It's not selfish to have a great place to live, good food for your body, or the things that make you really happy. To have the ability to give others abundance, you have to have it first. And the more you give, the more you'll receive. Now, sometimes we mistake this for monetary giving. And while that can be true, that's not really the point. Most of what we give is service and knowledge to other people. The universal energy is creative and it's constructive and it wants to be of service and it wants to share and it needs you to be a conduit for that creative energy. The universal energy expresses through you to create greatness in the world. It can't express itself if you're too busy with your own plans. And this is the selfishness I'm talking about. For instance, you might be able to be the happiest and most helpful person in the world by designing clothing. But if your parents forced you to become a doctor, the universal energy cannot express through you as easily while you're in med school or working at the hospital as it could if you were sitting at a drafting table or at your sewing machine. Yes, a doctor helps tons of people, but so do clothes. The only way to find out what your true calling is, is to find out where your eye is really directing you. And you can only really hear this deep part of your mind when you meditate and through contemplation. So the best thing you can do right now is quiet your senses, seek inspiration, focus on your world within, and contemplate the places your eye takes you. Now, overindulgence through addictions like work and food, alcohol, drugs, and even other people creates mental apathy and stagnation. The way to avoid this is to find your life's purpose and go into the silence as much as possible through meditation. When you take the time to quiet your mind, you don't need to escape from your thoughts through overindulgence. When you can only, or when you can openly look at the events, circumstances, and conditions that the eye is bringing into manifestation in your life, you'll see how you can become a creator. You'll see that what you are meant to do, you'll see what it is that you're meant to do with your life. The more you can build on what your eye is telling you, the more important your work becomes. When we're still, we think clearly. Now, thoughts a mode of motion carried by the law of vibration, just like electricity carries to a light bulb, right? Your thought is given life by your emotions. And your thoughts grow into the form of an object or an expression. And finally, your thoughts are the product of your eye, your spirit, and they're creative. And what I want you to take away this week is the idea that you don't just have your conscious mind and subconscious mind, but your true self, your eye underneath controlling it all. It's your spirit and it's one part of the universal whole. So this week, I want you to replace all your previous affirmations with one simple affirmation. I am what I will to be. I'm gonna type this in the chat so you can have it. It's I in quotation marks. I am what I will to be. Say that over and over and over this week. 
This week is about building the faith that when you say I, you're talking about your spirit. Your spirit is one with the universal spirit and has the same creative power as the universe. Remember that when you allow the universal energy to work through you, it'll find the quickest path to express itself in the best way to help mankind. And by saying this affirmation bit by bit, you'll remove the barriers that keep this universal energy from being able to work in the best way. That doesn't mean that your other affirmations are moot. You can still say them if you want, but you've put them into action and it's time to move on to something bigger. Now, to prove that the universal energy is creating a pathway for you, I want you to keep track of signs in your outer world that you're on the right path. Sometimes called synchronicity. This is when events happen that seem related, but have no discernible connection. For instance, say you need advice from an accountant and you just happen to run into your accountant friend at the grocery store. It's like the universe is giving you a big thumbs up telling you, yeah, you're doing the right thing. You're on the right track. I look at these events as proof of the universal energy connecting to my life's purpose, to my eye. Now I've had some really amazing events happen seemingly randomly that have totally changed my life. One in particular, I was in a motorcycle accident. I tried to learn how to ride a motorcycle and I did not graduate from motorcycle school. They wrecked the motorcycle and I ended up having to have physical therapy on my wrist for about six to 10 weeks. I can't remember exactly how long, but I was a piano player and I had taken on a job at a, as an administrative assistant at a music school. And so I was at a desk job. Well, when I hurt my wrist, it really jump-started my passion for playing the piano because I couldn't do it. So after it healed, I took on a teacher. I was placed completely randomly with a piano teacher in San Francisco, whose wife just happened to have a teaching position open at a music school the same week that I quit my desk job. Another guy who was a pianist, he, um, he delivered my mail at work. That was his desk job at work. He delivered the mail at my desk job and just happened to need a substitute for a musical theater gig that same week. Turns out at the musical theater gig, I ended up working with the girl whose job I had taken over teaching piano at the other school. Now she and I ended up working together a lot, seemingly randomly, but not so much. When you have these kind of things happen, it can seem really like kind of funny and ironic or you know, what a coincidence but it's actually a sign that your energy is right on track with your eye, which is one and the same as the creative force in the universe. It's like green lights and goodness coming at you from all directions. So each day, I want you to write down any instances of synchronicity or seemingly random but significant meetings or events that happen during your day. Don't think about making connections to things. Just write down any time you hear yourself saying, it's a really small world or what a coincidence. Some days you won't have any, but if you continue saying the phrase, I am what I will to be, I think you'll be surprised at how the universe will start bombarding you with information about when you're on the right track. Now for your meditation this week, take the time to relax in the same place and in the same way as before. This time you can sit for as long or as little as you like. You've probably figured out by now how comfortable you are sitting. You don't have to do 30 minutes if you don't want. If 20 minutes is comfortable for you, that's fine. Take a few minutes to run through your body and relax your muscles. And then during this meditation, I want you to take records of your thoughts and try to mentally let go of emotions like anger, hatred, worry, jealousy, envy, sorrow, trouble, or disappointment. I say it like it's really easy to do. It's not, but you can succeed by mentally determining to do so voluntarily and by being persistent. To aid you, each day when you meditate, stop when you catch yourself thinking. Write it down so you can choose to stop thinking about it and then go back into the silence. Anytime you feel your mind start spiraling into thoughts, just write it down. I find it kind of funny to see how quickly my mind can go from I'm sitting here and it's boring to what's for lunch to that restaurant's so good. I went there with my ex-boyfriend to like his new girlfriend really sucks. What does he see in her to like, where did I go wrong? And then ultimately I suck. I'm a horrible person. Now, the point of this exercise is to refuse to let your mind travel to that point of I'm a horrible person and stop when you get to what's for lunch, All right? You'll, you might fail at first. It's hard to stop the spiral when you get into it, but by choosing to stop and persisting in this exercise, you'll find that it gets easier and easier to stop the spiral of thoughts when they start. You'll recognize them. Now we're gonna do a quick writing exercise on this idea. So I want you to take a piece of paper and a pen or pencil and I want you to write down the phrase, I'm sitting at my computer. So 
So just write that down. I'm sitting at my computer. And I want you to just let your thoughts go. And I'm going to tell you when to stop, but I want you to just fill in as many different things as come up into your head. Okay? So ready? Go. Right. Okay, and stop. So I want you to look at your list and just like quickly how your thoughts went from I'm sitting at my computer to something completely different. I um, went through a whole cycle of stuff like class is awesome. My tea is getting cold. I wonder how I could keep it warm. I wonder if they can tell I'm nervous. That's what I wrote. Now, who cares whether I'm nervous or not? It doesn't matter. It's fine. But I don't need to let my thoughts spiral into that place. So did you guys go anywhere crazy? Is there anything? Did you guys surprise yourself? You can write it in the chat if you feel like it. <laughs> Lisa's all, oh yes. Yeah, I know. Thank you. I'm, I'm really not that nervous. It's just sometimes I get nervous. Michelle says, yeah, I went a little crazy. <laughs> Isn't it funny how just quickly and you're writing them down, it's, you can go so quickly from like, I'm just sitting here to feeling, you know, what's wrong with me? Yeah. It's just, someone said, you know, I spiraled into how depressed and lonely I feel like that's it's it happens that quick. So if you can stop yourself at I'm sitting at my computer class is awesome. That's a lot better than, you know, letting yourself dwell in the spiral. And the more you get into it, the more you spiral. And that was only 30 seconds. Imagine sitting it in silence for half an hour. You could spiral pretty far. So you have to find a way to stop those thoughts. It's like popping a balloon. When you, when you hear them, when you see them, when you catch yourself in a thought like that, just pop the balloon. If you feel like you need to, write it down write it down and i actually put a space in your journal for it so you can um so you can really free your mind you just write it down in the journal like especially like i had one where i did this earlier today and i was like i wonder if i have enough quarters to do laundry i should have gone to the bank like those are things that you should write on your to-do list you don't have to think about them when you're meditating you have bigger things to do now when you notice that you've gotten to the place where you've gotten to a place where you can write it down, do it, write it down, and then go back to silence. It's like a restart. You just you just constantly restart. It's not that much different than when you were sitting in the first couple weeks of meditation and your body was like, I gotta get up right now, and you wrote a check mark and you sat down again. It's just like starting over. It's just a little bit different because you're gonna pay attention to what you're thinking about. But see if you can stop yourself this week. That's it's a really big challenge, but it's gonna help you when we get into the future for setting bigger goals and really learning how to focus and visualize. So we're gonna move on now to our physical challenge. So for the past three weeks, I've challenged you to walk 10 minutes a day. And I hope this has been really enjoyable, even in the snow, but I encourage you to continue with these daily walks. I also asked you to start paying attention to some of your aches and pains. Today, I'm gonna to introduce you to resistance stretching and start the process of removing these pains. Now for the next week, I'd like you to do four stretches and strengthening exercises every day. They're simple and they don't take any longer than 10 minutes. You can do them in your regular clothes in a chair. No yoga mats required, no gym clothes are required. I've really focused on trying to make these stretches as simple and as possible or as simple as possible so that you can do them in a public setting without really feeling too awkward. And if you already know some resistance stretches, you can do some more advanced moves if you want to. Now, there are three rules to resistance stretching that make it a little different than other stretching methods and will ensure that you're not only stretching, but you're building strength as well as protecting your body. The first rule is to move. Now, chances are when you've stretched in the past, you've been told to hold a pose and wait for it to release. I don't believe that's beneficial for your body. 
In the stretches you'll learn this week, I want to focus on the movement from the starting position to the ending position and immediately return to the starting position. There's never a moment when you hold. You'll be constantly moving. Now the rule two, second rule, always resist. Now again, in traditional stretching exercises, you've been told to relax into a pose. Now this leads to overstretched muscles, which leads to unstable joints. You're not training to be a ballerina or a contortionist. You're training to live a solid, healthy life with the ability to move with confidence. Being able to do the splits is not as important as being able to move strong and stable within your range of motion for the rest of your life. So in each exercise, I'll give you an instruction on where to push or pull, and you'll have to adjust the level of resistance based on what feels good to you. Now it's okay to start off with a small amount of resistance and then increase it as you get more comfortable and your body gets stronger. During these stretches, you should always feel like you're doing a little bit of exercise, a little bit of work. It's not relaxing. I mean, it'll feel good, but you're not relaxing into a stretch. And the third rule is no pain equals no pain. Now somewhere along the line, somebody may have said to you, no pain, no gain, and I think that's a bunch of crap. Now you remember the story about the lion? You can't get a lion to relax by forcing it or by scaring it. Your muscles are similar. While you can consciously move them, you can't get them to relax by forcing them into a painful place. When doing these stretches, it's important to only move in ranges that feel safe and comfortable for you, even if you're only moving two inches. Lisa said she lost sound. Does anybody else lost sound too? Are we back in? Michelle has sound. Yeah, Lisa, that must be from your computer. Did you try calling in? Oh, you can't hear me. Sorry for the delay. Hopefully she'll be back on soon. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so somewhere along the line, somebody may have said to you, no pain, no gain. It's not good. So remember, if you are a lion, if your muscles behave like a lion, which they do, you can't scare it into relaxing. It's not going to work. It's going to be scared. It's going to tighten up, right? Your muscles are just like that. So you can't force them into a painful place and expect them to relax. It just doesn't work. So if people get hurt during yoga or where they just... You know, sometimes feel good after yoga, but sometimes feel not good. So you have to be really careful about how you stretch. So even if you're only moving an inch or two, it's okay. So say I'm stretching my arm this way. Even if I'm only moving this much, that's totally fine. Treat your muscles like a scared lion. Be slow, be safe, stay out of pain. That's how you're going to achieve results. All right. So as long as you remember the three rules, move, resist, no pain equals no pain, then you will be creating stronger and more stable muscles. So each week we're gonna add on to this group. So this week, don't skimp on these stretches. Try to commit these four stretches to memory. They're not hard. I'm gonna show you one simple one today. The rest of them are online in a video and they're also on the pages in your book. So you can try them from there. But um, I found that in class, it's it's a little weird for you to be doing the stretches in public, you know, at your office. So let me just back up a second so you can see me. We're going to do a neck and shoulder stretch. Now what you can do is take your left arm and put your right hand on top of it. And I'm adding resistance at my wrist and my hand here. So I'm pushing here and pushing here. It's like there's force between the two. I'm going to lift my left arm up into the air and then pull down with my right hand against resistance. Stretches out the top of my shoulder, and then at the end, I can stretch out my neck. Can you see all those muscles stretching out your neck, or my neck? That's where you'll feel that stretch. Now, I'm always moving, so I'm just gonna come up and down. Always the same. And I don't really ever stop. I just keep moving up and down. Now, the other thing is that I'm always resisting. So there's always a fight going on between my wrist and my hand right here. My arm's starting to get tired, so you know you're working. It shouldn't be too easy to do. It should feel like a little bit of effort. 
And then again, no pain, no pain, right? So if you're really tight or if you have any kind of shoulder problems, only go in a range that feels really good to you and that's gonna be totally safe, all right? So when you do these stretches, you're gonna do about mm, six to 10 on each side, but you wanna make sure that you feel good. So if you get tired after two or three, that's fine. Just do two or three. As you do them every day, you're gonna start to feel like you can do more. Eventually you'll do about 10 every time. Uh, more than that, it's kind of a waste of time, so you don't have to do any more. But it should take you about 10 minutes. Now, you do have a video, and this um, is on your Stretch Chi How to Feel Alive page, where all the videos are. Um, it's already up, so you can go ahead and do those right after if you want to. And um, you can do them along with me in the video if you want for the first couple weeks. But I want you to try to memorize them because they're not that hard to learn, and you kind of want to be able to do them anywhere you are, okay? And then for your diet challenge. For the past couple weeks, you've been retraining yourself to eat natural foods, and I've given you permission to eat as much of it as you want. Now this week we're gonna take that awareness a step further, but we're gonna start the process of eating less. Now we all know that when we're watching our weight, the first thing we do is cut out sweets. But we also know that the stress of dieting and depriving yourself can make it easy to overindulge when your diet's over. I'm suggesting that you find a balance by allowing yourself to have one to two small treats a day to keep your sanity. Unless you have a problem with sugar like diabetes, I suggest that you allow yourself to eat 32 grams or less of sugar a day. Now that's eight teaspoons of sugar. It's a lot and you can love every minute of it. So where's the challenge here? It's in discovering how much sugar you actually eat throughout the day. It's easy to overlook the sugars and condiments like ketchup or the large amounts of hidden sugar that are in dried fruit or juice or even soda. And then also like it's the holiday season so you might have a Hershey kiss here or a cookie here or somebody brings something in you feel like you have to eat it. Now this week your challenge is to limit your sugar intake to 32 grams or less and to find really good dessert options without going for anything that's sugar free or fat free. Now that includes diet sodas, right? Now for instance, something like a pudding snack. Pudding snack has 20 grams of sugar excuse me, 20 grams of sugar, but it also has more than three ingredients that I can't buy in the grocery store, which is against the rules from before. So you'll wanna look for a better option. So look for things that are natural. Did you know you can have eight dark chocolate Dove Promises? They're those little Dove squares. Dark chocolate, eight of them. An entire Choco Love almond and sea salt dark chocolate bar is like this big. It's nearly impossible to eat the whole thing it's under 32 grams of sugar. Now the higher the quality of the sweet, the more likely you are to be satiated by a small amount if you take your time and enjoy it. Now when you do take the time to eat your sweet, relish every minute of it. Don't eat it while you're driving, don't eat it while you're watching TV. If you're gonna eat sweets, do it right, make it a treat. I have these special dessert plates, check this out. Isn't that pretty? And I'll put a cookie on it and I'll make my cup of tea and this is like a treat for me. Now this cookie here is delicious and it has 18 grams of sugar only, which is well under 32 grams. And that way if anything else comes up during the day, like if I wanna have catch up on my french fries, that's all right. Or if, you know, I decide to put a little bit of creamer in my coffee, that's, I'm gonna still be okay. I'm still gonna be under 32 grams. Now eating a treat like this is a gift and I really enjoy it. Like I'll sit down, I'll just make it a ritual. On the other hand, sometimes I mindlessly eat candy. Like I'll buy a candy bar because I'm hungry and I'll eat it while I'm walking home. And I realize after that I feel really gross and I didn't even really taste it and it was a complete waste of something that could have brought me a lot of pleasure. So if you're going to indulge, do it right. So this week I want you to keep a list of how much sugar you're eating during the day. You don't have to go crazy with exact numbers, but you can usually check the nutritional content on packaged food and do a quick internet search for anything that doesn't have a package, anything natural. Try to stay within 32 grams. And if you go over, don't punish yourself. Just be aware of how you feel when you overindulge and how you feel when you stay under 20 or 32 grams. Well, the point of this week is for your body to feel what it is to actually eat a healthy amount of sugar. Now, this week is a little different than the others. Your guided journaling will be a daily practice instead of something you can do right now. If you miss a day, it's okay, but I want you to really focus on what kind of synchronicities are coming up for you. 
Replace your affirmations with I am what I will to be. Continue walking, but also add in these stretches. They're all for your neck and shoulders. So they'll make you feel amazing and they release all sorts of anxious tension from the holidays. And finally, choose your sweets wisely. Keep it under 32 grams. But most importantly, don't just eat mindlessly. Enjoy it. Enjoy each and every bit. I also, real quick, have a couple announcements. I'm actually going to be teaching a really special workshop in person in Chicago, and I'm also going to broadcast it online um, on setting goals instead of resolutions for the new year. This workshop is only $25, and it's going to be super cool. I'm really excited about it. That's on January 4th, and I'd love to see you all there. It's all about setting goals and figuring out how to get them done, reflecting on the year, reflecting on the new year. It's going to be really great. Also, the next Life Renovations course starts on January 6th. Now, the next six weeks is all about growth. We talk about materialize, materialization, about power, about abundance, about seeing the big picture, and even about love a little. So I hope you'll sign up for this next course. Now, sometimes people feel a bit behind after course one, especially if it's your first time through and they want to repeat it again. And if you feel like you just didn't get to everything this time around, you can sign up for course one again and catch the things that you feel like you didn't master this time around. And one last thing, I'm hosting a retreat in Tuscany, March 22nd through 29th. I'm so incredibly excited about this trip. We're going to cover book one of Life Renovations, this course that you've just done in one week intensively. It's meditation, stretching, walking, and group classes, plus plenty of time for rest, for relaxation, and also for tourist stuff in Tuscany. As a group, we'll go on a walking castle tour and a farm tour and a wine tour in the Chianti region, and we'll do day trips in Siena and Florence. The owner of the villa is also an amazing chef and will be preparing our food according to my diet, Life Renovations diet, which is dairy-free, gluten-free, low sugar, and lots of healthy foods, which you think would be awful in Italy, but it's gonna be fantastic and you'll feel really great. So I'm really excited about this trip. The early bird rate is $14.95 for a single room. That includes all meals, tours, housing, and classes, but you're responsible for your travel. Um, but per couple, the rate's $26.95, so you save a little bit that way. There are a small amount of rooms, a very small amount of rooms with twin beds. But most likely, if you're doing a couple room, it would mean that you'd be sharing a bed unless you sign up early enough to get the twin beds before they're taken. If you have any questions about these events or classes, feel free to ask them in the question and answer. But that wraps it up for this week. So if you need to log off, because we're going a little overtime today, if you need to log off, go ahead and do so now. And um, I'll stick around for question and answers. So how are you guys doing this week? What's going on? How have you been feeling? Anybody? Good. People are feeling good, huh? Much better. Very good. Yeah, it's, it, Lisa said she's finding it difficult to meditate, and that's, but that's nothing new for her. But this, it is difficult to meditate, and you just have to find the amount of time that you're able to do. And so, like I said today, it might be that instead of a half hour, you do five minutes right now. And then when you get more comfortable with it, you'll... Um, you know, it'll, it'll be a little bit easier. And then really like the hardest part is just sitting down, you know, like the hardest part is just finding the time to do it. When I used to teach piano lessons, I told my students all the time, like, it doesn't matter how long you practice or what you do. The hardest part is just sitting down. Goodbye, Michelle. See you next time. So, you know, that's the, that's the key. Just sit. And you can do your meditations anywhere. Like if you can't, if you don't feel like you can, um, you don't feel like you can really sit and in one time at one place all the time you can meditate at work you know take a second when nobody's gonna bug you and just take a couple minutes to yourself that's totally fine um, and Lisa also says I'm looking forward to the stretching I have problems with my knees and ankles which makes movement harder yeah we're gonna get into some lower body stuff next week that'll be that'll be really good for your knees and ankles so that's really cool that'll be good and then if they're really struggling, you could come in and have a private session. Those are, that's how I can really get to the problem and get things fixed for you. That would be awesome. All right. Are there any questions about class today? Yeah? No? <laughs>
All right, good. I think we're all right then. All right, well then I will see you guys next week. Everything you need is up online on um, Stretch Chi. I'm gonna put this in the... in the chat so that you have that link. Copy it, bookmark it. That's your, um, it's, a, it's not searchable, it's a private page. So um, that has the exercises, the stretching exercises. Then once you have this, the video of the stretching exercises, you can bookmark that link in YouTube so that you don't have to constantly be going back to get it every time. Just find the bookmark, okay? All right, very good. Well, I'll see you guys next week. Have a great one.